Welcome to Bandit's Keep. I'm Daniel. In this video, I'm going to talk about magic and how the magic system you choose will help shape your world building. This is kind of something that's been in my mind a little bit lately because I got an email from William who asked about uh, you know magic question, basically casting from spell books and what I thought about that because they th thought they had uh, remembered me saying something about it. And my answer to, to them was, you know, you have to think about magic and what it is in your world and how that changes the world if you, any changes you make to it. This is true of any system really in the game, but magic is really important because if we change, let's say, from your classic basic expert, BX, if you're not familiar with that system, I'll put links in the description. That's the system I usually go to, old school type gaming here. A system where this magic user only knows the spell they know and they need to memorize it before they basically go out adventuring for the day, that changes very much the system if magic users can just open their book and cast and don't have to pre-memorize. And this is not necessarily a bad thing, it's just something that you want to consider. So I'll start off by saying that when we create our worlds as dungeon masters or referees or game masters, depending on what you're playing, we often think about technology. A lot of times we think about that. You might be saying technology. No, I'm playing D&D. Well, if you're playing D&D, most people play in kind of a medieval-ish world, right? We think about what's available as far as armors and weapons and transportation, the horses and stuff like that. And then we add magic or anything extra on top of that. Some of us, though, might play in a later period where, let's say, there's black powder. So now we have guns. You might play something like Lamentations of the Flame Princess where... Even though it's an optional rule, everyone I play with with limitations usually uses guns on some level. You might play in something even older, in a sense, and play ancients, where it's like bronze weapons and or less armor and these kind of things, right? So maybe you're playing with that's the technology level, and that think about it, that affects the game, right? If you are if you have available heavy iron plate versus only leather armor, or you have black powder weapons versus let's say bows, that's going to change how the game plays. Well, magic is the same. If magic is something rare and powerful, or rare and not powerful, or versus being everywhere, right? Think about Harry Potter or something to that system where, sure, in the, I guess the muggle world, there's no magic, but in the Harry Potter world, there's magic everywhere. And it's just part of life. It becomes almost like technology for them. They use it in everything they do. And the children are taught the magic and they're able to cast spells pretty much whenever they want, once they know how to master it. This is a much different world than a very rare, think of like, if you've ever seen the movie Conan the Barbarian, where he meets the magician and the, the spell is like, the, the dark cast, if you want to call it that, is long and uh, arduous with like runes written all over Conan's skin because he's basically dead and uh, to bring him back, like to heal him. And it's a massive process where there's where the spirits and everything involved. It's a much, much different thing than walking around and, you know, making uh, spells, literally killing someone with two words or two words in Harry Potter like that, if you're a powerful magician. So it's a much different world. And both types of worlds are really cool. It just kind of depends on what you're trying to create. Magic is one of those areas for me anyways. And I think for a lot of people that when we first start homebrewing or hacking or playing around with our system is something we mess with. Everything in D&D is great. You sit down, you're playing, you're super enjoying it. And then you're like, what can we change to make it better for my table? And one of the things that I really started to mess with was magic. I think a lot of times people mess with it because they feel like, especially with maybe less experienced players or players who have a different expectation, that magic isn't powerful enough in an old school game because it's more rare. And they want to give the players more magic, which is totally legit and fine. And then some people think, well, no, magic should be more difficult. And I've seen movies or read books where the, they have to like cut themselves, or they hurt themselves, or magic drains them. How can we change magic to do that? How can we make it this? And we start playing around with magic systems. There are tons. If I look at my shelf, I've probably got a dozen or more variations on magic systems for OSR type games. In the end, I went back to straight Vancean. And I guess I'll talk a little bit about that, but because I just felt like it fit better for my world. But the reason why is I started thinking to myself, and this is what you should think as you're developing your magic system or thinking about magic, is what exactly is magic in the game? Now, the world, of course, obviously, it's important, and we're going to shape the world around what we decide, but I think you want to think about magic as far as a gameable thing. Do you want a situation where magic is readily available and players can cast lots of different spells? 
Do you want it to be more rare? Do you want and How is that? What does it mean to you? What is magic? So for me, I like magic being something that you have to effectively equip. It's a piece of gear that you're taking with you. And for me, and I've talked about this before, part of player skill is deciding what to bring with you. The idea of encumbrance and thinking, well, I need to bring a, a rope and some spikes and that's going to carry be some weight. So I'm not going to be able to carry whatever it is that the other thing, a ladder, right? So I'm going to choose to take the rope and the spikes versus the ladder because I think it's going to work for me and that's my player skill. I'm going to choose to take the read magic spell and invisibility instead of magic missile and phantasmal force because I think that's going to work for me better in this day, this adventure that I'm going on. And that's how I like to think of magic. If you like to think of it as, well, the magic user can just build up lots and lots of spells and cast what they need whenever they need it, that's also a great way to play. And it changes the expectations at the table. It changes. I've heard people say, well, you know, I don't li I like what they call spontaneous casting because if I don't do that, then all my players just take the magic missile spell or the sleep spell or whatever. But to me, what that says is then you're not creating adventures that need those other things, right? If you have lots of unknown things, if you're honest, if you're always like, well, you find a magic sword or there's writing here and yeah, you can read it if you make an intelligence check, then of course, nobody's going to take detect magic or read languages or any of these things, right? Or if you, you know, if you create situations where there aren't ancient tomes where people have to figure out and you may allow arcana checks and these kind of things, then of course, why would you take those spells, right? If you're just going to let it happen. But if you, if players often can't solve problems, meaning they have to not get further in that direction of the dungeon they wanted to go and they've got to leave and come back or go a different route and miss that section of the dungeon because they don't have these utility spells as people call them, then the players will take them. I think the idea of just saying, well, I'm just going to give them the ability to just cast whatever they want when they want so they can do it doesn't really fix the inherent problem that is the players are taking the spells. It's not even a problem. The inherent fact that the players are taking the spells that they think are the most useful for the game you're creating. When you read The Dying Earth, for instance, which is where the Bansian system comes from, they talk about in several of the different stories why the magicians take the spells they do, that they can only equip so many spells that they have that they're thinking about what's going on and they're planning what they're about to do. So they're memorizing, as it would be, the spells. And I think if you haven't read The Dying Earth, it's worthwhile to read the first book of it. It's a bunch of short stories. At least read a couple of them. You'll get an idea of how the magic system uh, kind of came to life for D&D. And if you look at it like that, I think you understand it more. It doesn't seem so weird. Because I think the way it's written in D&D can often be a little bit weird that you memorize the spell. And I get that why that seems weird to people. But again, both systems are great. And for a long time, I played 5th edition. And that's more of a spontaneous cast system, right? You're a spellcaster, like a wizard. You have X number of spells you can know. And you can cast them in any way and flavor you want. I guess the idea there is that you've only got so much magic energy inside your body and once you expend it, you can't do any more, All right? Also a cool way to do it. What it does mean is that you're going to have wizards that are going to be more versatile that aren't going to have to access their spell books as often, which means that they can potentially go, let's say, on longer journeys. Because if you if you use the rules and you think about it, and again, in the Vance books, the, the magic is rare. And these, uh, which we'll talk about in a second, these magicians don't aren't carrying their spell books around with them. They are memorizing these spells before they go on this adventure. And that's all they got. They got the four spells. They might be gone for a week and that's all they have. I know most people don't play like that and they just let the players have a new spell every day or re renew their spell. But if you think of it like that, that's even more rare. Spells become even more important. Of course, in that situation, now you're looking at these, this idea that like magic users might not be strong enough, if, especially with, like let's say, the basic expert rules where they got a D4 hit dice and they can only use daggers and blah, blah. This is, you know, if you're going to have a combat heavy game, that's tough. So... Thinking about all these factors, what would what would potentially a wizard do if the magic user if they could only memorize their one spell and they were going out for a week? Like, what would they have to do, and how can we make that fun for them? And if we can't, then we're going to change that, right? We're going to make the world the way that's going to be fun for our players. So I see a few different kind of common threads into how magic is presented, and I kind of hit it on just a minute ago, and I'm just going to talk about each one and how I think that the world is in that sense, right? So if you go straight Vancean where the characters have to, uh, you know, memorize the spell before they go on each adventure. And if they carry the spell book with them, it's going to be uh, something they got to protect, right? They don't want to lose the spell book because the spells were rare. 
This now makes the spell choice very particular. It's literally laying out your gear like you're going on a, a camping trip and you can only carry so much in your backpack. How many arrows is the fighter taking? How many, you know, uh, is the thief taking an extra set of lockpicks? How much rations are you taking? Are you taking holy water, oil, torches? What spell am I going to take? This is really what you're looking at here. This makes the game a little bit more of a survival type game, if you want to think about it, where you really have to plan ahead. This is the spell I'm taking. This is the spell I have. I'm not going to get it back. I need to use it at the right moment. It's a little bit of a challenge and can be fun for some players. Then you've got... So what this means to the world is that wizards aren't going to be casting all the time because if you leave your house with a spell and you're not coming back for three days, you're not going to throw down that read magic spell the first time you see something you think might be magic. You're going to wait and collect things, right? There's going to be a bit of a delay. Things are going to take time. You're going to really have to consider when to use it. And that means that magic users aren't going to be casting all the time unless they are close to their home base. So you'll find wizard towers with high-level magic users that don't travel very far because they want to be able to keep rememorizing. You won't find them wandering, let's say Gandalf, right, wandering around. They're going to want to stay close to their towers, close to their books. They're going to really want to protect those books because they need, if they lose them, they're in trouble, right? If you look at something like a spontaneous cast in the way that, like, say, 5th edition works, where you memorize those spells and then you can wander out and every day you just get a refresh, and now you're going to find wizards that are going to travel a lot more. They're going to be more likely to cast spells at random because they know that they just have to rest a bit and they'll get them all back. They're going to be much more freewheeling with them. You're going to find traveling wizards. You're going to find adventuring wizards that go off, wizards that don't even have towers. You're going to find this kind of thing, which is, again, a pretty cool and interesting way. This is also true for systems that use magic points. I mean, magic points is basically just another version of spontaneous casting. It's just another way of planning your spells. So if you think about it, you've got your Bansian memorization, you've got your spontaneous casting, and then you've got what I'll call freestyling. Things, games like Ars Magica, uh, it seems like the Lavender Hack, which I've been kind of perusing, has this, um, in my own words, magic system. It's like this, where the magic user can just cast. Uh, some of the spells take longer. They're going to create spells spontaneously on the spot. This falls, this creates a world, assuming that wizards are relatively common, which I think in Ars Magica they're not. So that's this creates a world where magic is plentiful and everywhere because if you can just cast whenever you want even if there's a chance of a failure you're going to be casting spells people are going to be casting spells left and right you're going to find the remains of problematic areas of spells you're going to find places where spells were greatly successful you're going to find magic users that got themselves in trouble you're going to find magic users that are heroes magic is going to become something that is just really common this is something you also see in let's say dungeon crawl classics now, you might be thinking, well, hold on, Dungeon Crawl Classics is always... But the thing is, Dungeon Crawl Classics allows for, effectively, unlimited casting unless you roll really badly. And even if you roll badly, you still get your spells back the next day. So if you're playing Dungeon Crawl Classics, you could cast your spell at first level 10 times in a day and never have a problem as long as you roll well, right? So, again, uh, the world of Dungeon Crawl Classics, assuming you're not making wizards uh, rare by some other means, because there's no nothing in the book that says they are, or they might say they are, but there's nothing in the book that makes them rare. The magic should be everywhere in DCC. DCC should be a world filled with magic. And I think it is. I, mean, I think a lot of the, the high-level modules, that's gone so crazy and there's magic everywhere. But that's the thing, right? That's what you're creating. You're creating a system where magic is common, magic is everywhere, because people can cast whenever they want, and wizards aren't controlled as far as how many there can be. Okay, let's talk about who has magic and how rare it is. Now... I'm saying if magic is easy to cast, then it's common. And you might be saying, well, no, PCs are special and they're the only ones that have magic. But the thing is, that may be true, but how did the PCs come across the magic? If it's just, I can roll the wizard whenever I want, then it's not uncommon. Because if my wizard dies, then I'll just roll another wizard. And that's the way it is. If you think about what some of the things like, let's say, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons did, first edition, they made it, not for magic users, but they made it more difficult, illusionist, they made it more difficult to play certain classes, like a paladin is the classic one where they have to have like a 17 charisma. If you make certain classes harder to qualify for, in this case, magic user classes, then you're going to end up with less magic users. You could also make a rule of something like, this is if you want to have a low magic world, where, okay, there can only ever be one magic user in the group, and if the if the magic user dies, that player can never play two magic users in a row. So you've got four players, 
they're out adventuring their third, fourth, fifth level, and then the magic user dies and they bring in a new character. It can't be a magic user. Now there's no magic user in the group. And one of the other players could play a magic user, but they'd have to give up their character that's leveled up a bunch to do it. So unless the group really wants a magic user, you're not going to do that, right? So now magic users are rare. I did this when I was running second edition and I was running, I wanted to run something more of like a Conan type story. That's exactly what I did. One magic user in the group, no clerics. And if if that magic user died, that same player could not play a magic user. And that's exactly what happened. One At some point, the magic user died and nobody wanted to give up their character that earned a bunch of levels. So nobody played a magic user for a while. And it cre- and I didn't put a lot in the world, the occasional bad guy magic user. So magic was rare. These are the things you have to put in place if you want it to actually feel rare, because otherwise it's not. I, I don't care how many times you tell me PCs are special. If you can roll up anything you want, then that thing's not rare. And again, rolling back, this is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just a different way of playing. So who has the magic? If you look at, again, we'll go back to Vance. They talk about how in the early books that there's, there was a thousand spells in the world or maybe more. And now there's only about a hundred of them and only a handful of wizards have them. And they are tightly controlled people. If you want to learn a spell, you have to go to another magic user and ask them to teach it to you. And they're usually going to ask something of you in return, some kind of quest or something. This makes magic, again, more rare, harder to get. How do we get new spells? If you just automatically get a new spell every level, then it's not that rare. If there's magic schools that teach you a spell, it's not that rare. Why are they teaching you the spells? Are they requiring something of you? When you just go into this tower to a wizard and say, hey, I'm, I've am i leveled up. I'd like to learn a new spell. They just allow you to learn the spell. If two PC characters just meet and they've, they, they didn't know each other their whole lives, they've just met, and now suddenly they're swapping spell books, like, would they do that? And if they do that, that sets a tone of magic in the world. If magic users are just like, hey, copy my notes, copy my notes, then magic will be everywhere and not rare. So again, it's not a bad thing. It's just, it's something you have to think about. Who controls the magic? Who is allowed to have the magic? How do you learn the magic? Do you need to quest to do it? Do you need to do favors for wizards and such to learn spells from their books? Do you need to kill them to to take their stuff? Is this what's going to happen? Is there a war between magic users and they're all paranoid and they hate other magic users because they're constantly after their spells? This can really help you build the feel in, of your world that way, right? Because how is magic distributed? Who is allowed to have the magic? And maybe that can be a plot point in your world that one of the characters is a magic user or wants to be a magic user, but they're not allowed to learn magic. Let's say if you take the Earthsea books, for instance. In Earthsea, all the wizards are men, right? They're, they're boys, basically. They're they're brought to a school and they're learned. But mag- women have magic. They, they have women's magic, which which is, uh, they're witches, basically. And the witches have things like healing and like really kind of minor magics and detection magic and stuff like that. Whereas the wizards can like control the winds and they go on sailboats and they, you know, can do all the blah, blah, blah. Right. So this is the difference, right? The, the, the women are, t- are typically not allowed to learn the magic of the men and the men don't learn the magic of the women. It's like two separate things. It's an interesting concept. I don't know that I personally would want to use that, but I think it's an interesting thing. You could say elves have different magic than humans, for instance, or the, if you allow things like dwarves to have magic and dwarves have their own kind of magic, right? And maybe that's one of the reasons why the various races of the world need to work together. Maybe the dwarves have the magic of, to be common trope, the dwarves have the magic of like forging, but elves have the magic of the mystical magic. So they must work together to create weapons because the dwarves have to forge it while the elves cast the incantations. And this creates alliances. And then if there's wars, maybe certain things are happening and weapons aren't made or you know, there's all kinds of things you can do in your world if magic is limited to only certain groups. Maybe it has it's a it's an upper class society. So maybe you make your your wizard uh, only have a handful of spells available to them, the common spells. They can have you know detect magic and whatever, but they're never going to get magic missile or sleep or you know some of these more powerful spells because those are kept for the upper class. And the the magic user character has to quest in order to get gold and prove that they are worthy of these spells by throwing lavish parties and. And then you had this kind of stuff going on, right? So this is all the thing that we can do to make our world more interesting by using the magic system and not just having it be another thing that's on the character sheet. Oh, my character has charm person. How? When are they, does everybody have charm person? Think about it. If charm person was a super common spell, and I'm talking about in an old school system, it's a really powerful spell, right? People would be charmed all over the place. It, it, how, how did people get access to this? 
So if you are doing a world building type thing, we do want to think about these things on some level. Okay, so to kind of wrap up and tie things together, I'm going to go through a few systems that I play or have played a lot and kind of talk about what I think about the magic system, how it works, and really, really briefly, just some ideas. I would love to hear in the comments about magic systems you've used or what you think about magic in general and world building. Have you thought about it like this, or do you just, it's just another thing on the character sheet? So let's start off with what I've been talking about, which is effectively basic expert or OD&D, which is what I'm playing now. OD&D being original Dungeons and Dragons, which is the, the little brown books. So in basic expert, you are allowed to have only the spells that you know in your spell book, and you can only know a certain number of spells. This again, keeps spells pretty limited and rare. A character must memorize the spell before the adventure, or like I say, most people allow them to do it in the morning. They got to have a spell book and they automatically learn new spells when they go up a level because there are wizard schools that they are part of that's kind of implied in the setting. I've never really played in a game where I actually had them go to the wizard school and negotiated. It was just something that we allowed. So that's the idea, right? So you could look at it like since they're traveling, maybe there's wizards in each you know town or large city that are part of these schools that have graduated. And if you show up with your with your records that you say, yes, I'm part of the white wizard school, the blue wizard school, the green wizard school, then they will... Uh, They'll teach you a spell if you if you need to know it. This, again, makes the choice of magic, especially at the beginning of a level, important. Because whatever spell you choose is the spell you get. You can't switch it out. And it just becomes part of your gear. You become, like, if you think about it, like the dwarf has the ability to find better traps than everybody else or in provision. The magic user has the ability to read magic once a day, right? That's basically what you got. It's almost like an ability. This is, I think, a really good way to play when you have new players because it keeps things really simple. When I do one shots and stuff, especially with high level uh, magic users, you know, I just list all the spells and I'm just like, as you use them, cross them off. It's like you use a, a vial of oil, you use a charm person spell. It's equipment. You're just using it. Again, good for new players. The way that I run original Dungeons and Dragons, because it doesn't actually say how many spells you start with, is I had them start with a spell book. They still have to memorize it ahead of time, but they can change their spells, you know, each day if they want. So I give them a little more versatility there. The reason why I do that is because I'm playing with a more experienced group and I feel like they don't need to be restricted to the one spell. And I kind of like that. I'm also mixing in spells from other systems and stuff because I feel like the Three Little Brown Books OD&D is super open-ended and versatile that you can do that. So, But again, in, in my world uh, that I'm running there, spells are pretty rare because the characters only start with their spell books that they got from their school and they do not automatically learn spells once they start with their character if they start with like five spells in their book that's it you need to find spells you need to negotiate with people you need to get the spells so you've got more versatility in choosing the spells but getting the spells is harder you might reach a level where you can cast a certain level spell but you don't have that spell yet you know you might get to the point where i'm like, oh, on fifth level i can cast a third level spell but i don't have any in my spell book so i can't cast it so this allows the characters to have more versatility, but it also makes them have to quest for spells. Another one that I played a lot of, though I don't play much anymore, is 5th edition D&D. Wizards start with a lot of spells. They have they effectively have to memorize them, but they can memorize a bunch. And it's usually, unless you have a really low intelligence, you can pretty much memorize all the spells you have, at least at lower levels. And it's spontaneous casting. So you just choose, you, you, you've got like 10 spells in your memory. I mean, not spell, maybe not 10, maybe you have like five or six spells in your memory. And if you have two spell slots, you can cast whatever spell you want, whenever you want it. This creates a world, again, where magic is really super common. Plus, in 5th edition, they have cantrips, which cantrips make an incredibly magical world. You cannot play, in my opinion, a low magic world with cantrips like they have in 5th edition. It's just not possible. Now, those cantrips are a big part of the balance if you're using 5th edition and trying to create achieve balance. So, if you take those away the magic users become much less powerful because the spells have also been, to use a term that people like to use, nerfed, where they're not nearly as powerful as they are in older editions, relatively speaking. So if you remove the cantrips from the 5th edition characters, the magic users kind of become a little bit weak, in my opinion, compared to the fighter characters. And this is not the way the system is designed. It's designed to be more equal. So I wouldn't do that. So you've got cantrips, they can cast at will, they can choose their spells at will. Magic is really, really common. And if you look at the Forgotten Realms, which is the base setting for 5th edition, it's a super magical world. You go down to get a kebab at the stand and there's like an illusion that's selling it to you. You know, that's the world of 5e. It's super high magic, which is pretty cool if you like that kind of world and pretty awesome. 
Let's go completely in the other direction now and look at a game called The Hateful Place. I've done some, I've talked about this a little bit and I made a supplement for it. The Hateful Place is a post-apocalyptic game. You can run it in any setting you want, but it's always after an apocalypse. There are only 10 spells in the world. They are crazy, crazy powerful. Anytime you cast a spell, you take damage. You can only cast each spell once per week. You, um, you, most of the spells have a chance that they can kill you or backfire on you when you cast it, but they are absolutely devastating. The kinds of spells that you can completely wipe out a village or even a small city with. This is powerful, powerful magic that is rare and dangerous. There's no real rules in the hateful place, as far as I can tell, for learning your spells. You start with a handful of them and that's it. But that game's really designed around running more shorter, uh, you know, one shots or two shots and stuff. So I think that that just not something that was factored in. If I was going to do it, I would make it incredibly, incredibly rare to learn new spells. You definitely would not get them at, I mean, there's, there's no real levels in the game. You definitely wouldn't just get them at intervals. You would have to quest for them if I was running a campaign. Because again, there's only 10 in the world and they're incredibly powerful. Much different system. You're not going to see magic very often. In fact, I would think that if somebody casts a magic spell, like let's say the fire spell that they have that destroys a mile worth of land, if you cast that spell and anybody survives, you are going to be hunted down because you are looked at as an incredibly dangerous person, even if you did it for a good cause. So magic there is scary, powerful, and risky. Different vibe. You're not going to cast spells. I've had plenty of players play a magic using a character in that and never cast a spell. DCC. I talked about this a little bit before. Dungeon Crawl Classics. By the way, I'll put links to all of these that I can in the description below to see if you don't know what they are and you want to look at them deeper. deeper. Dungeon Crawl Classics is, uh, it's funny because it's, it's based around the idea of the Appendix N, which was uh, effectively in the first edition Dungeon Master's Guide, reading that Gary Gygax, the, one of the creators, suggested. So, uh, they looked at the, the the appendix end and they they read all these books and they were like, okay, let's create a system around this that has this kind of gonzo weirdness. And a lot of people think like, oh, because this is the stuff that's quoted a lot, the main stuff, right? Like Vance and Conan, but there's a lot of weird stuff in that uh, appendix end. It's worthwhile to look at. But anyways, Dungeon Crawl Classics magic system is really interesting because it is spontaneous casting, but you roll on a table when you cast and what you get is based on your roll. Now, the higher level you are, the, the more skilled you are, you, you have bonuses, so you're more likely to roll high. But you can get everything from you try to cast a spell and you grow tentacles out of your back to you you know cast a sleep spell that knocks everybody out within five miles. Like <laughs> It can be really swingy and really wild. But unless you roll really terrible, you don't lose the spell. And even if you do, you get it back the next day, which means that in Dungeon Call Classics, unless you, and there's no rule that I can see in the book to do this, Unless you limit the number of spellcasters, magic is incredibly, incredibly common and incredibly, incredibly powerful. And you, depending on where it is in the history of the place, people might be fearful of magicians and be running them out of town or attacking them because they did some terrible spell. Or they might just be like chasing you around. A cleric in Dungeon Call Classics can heal unlimited as long as they don't roll terribly. They could sit there healing left and right. Imagine this, a world where... Somebody could, you could have a priest or a, you know, set up a cleric, set up at a, at a, a temple where people just come in and they're just like, heal, 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 heal. I mean, magic is really common. A DCC campaign written, using the magic system as written is a world where magic is incredibly plentiful and it's everywhere and people fear it, but they also use it all the time, right? So I ran one long-ish campaign in a DCC and I've run tons of like shorter things and one shots. In that campaign, the magic was able to be kept a little bit more reasonable as far as like not being everywhere because the characters, it was a one-on-one -on -one campaign. The player played one magic user and one thief, I think. And where they traveled to, there wasn't any magic users for the most part. I think they encountered one witch during the whole campaign. And that made magic rare. Even though that magic user could cast as much as they wanted, magic wasn't common. And of course, the character, the player, was careful because they knew that in a place where magic isn't common, casting all the time is going to get people staring at you and they didn't want to be <laughs> that focus of attention, if you know. So it kept it a little bit rare there. But again, if you roll by the book and anybody can roll a magic user and anybody can roll a, a cleric as much as they want, you're going to get lots and lots and lots of magic. And that can be really cool. Now, I'm working on another system that is 
two systems, really. If you follow my podcast, which again, link in the description, I've been taking original Dungeons & Dragons and using the chain mail system. Because when you look at that first book, that the three little brown books when D&D was first released, and people often laugh, oh, oh, they made you buy another game. But they recommend to use the chain mail game. And chain mail is a war game. Now, I found that using chain mail in lieu of the alternate combat system, the D20 system that became the common system, really changes the game. But I'm not going to talk about that right this second. I'm also working on a second game that I'm just using chain mail and starting from the ground up. Like if if you had chain mail and nobody ever came to you and said, hey, this is the kind of dungeon stuff we're doing, however the genesis of D&D was, and you just created a role-playing game from it, what would you get? And this is what I'm doing. And in chain mail is only like 15 or 16 spells, and they are incredibly powerful because they're made for war. And in my game... You wizards are rare, basically. I, I only allow X number per party and whatever. But also, spells take hours to cast. So now you're looking at that, that we talked about at the beginning, that Conan the Barbarian movie where they spent the whole night writing runes on the body and stuff in order to cast a spell. Magic is rare because it takes a long time to cast. It's not rare in wars, but there's not a war everywhere. Your, your seer, as the magic user is in that, is not going to stop and cast a spell in the middle of combat. But they're able to do things like read magical writings. They can counter spell, uh, you know, magical effects. So that keeps them magical in a different way. This is a different kind of thing because now the magic user is more somebody who's trained in defending themselves and learning about magic, and not somebody who's running around casting spells. Which means that spells are more rare, and typically what you're going to run into is things that have been enchanted, like magical, you know, portals and stuff that the seer is going to know about, not so much them running around making light spells or cure light wound spells and that kind of stuff. Again, it changes the world to a place where you're studying it. It's almost like science, right? This, You know these things exist out there. You're not making experiments all the time, but you know about it, so you can kind of work your way through it and deal with it, if that makes sense. So lots of different ways that your world can be affected by magic. If magic is rare, that is, few people can cast it, it might be something that is sought after, or it might be something that is thought to be should be destroyed, right? Especially by you know certain groups. If magic is common, then it then it's going to be everywhere, and people are going to be using it all the time, and it will change how people react to the characters. It'll change what's available, right? Are there teleportation circles in every big city? They were in my five E world. Are there uh, flying ships? Are there all these other things? Because if magic exists and it's common in the magic item shops and stuff like that. That's a whole other thing, right? We're talking about items now. This changes the view of your world and how it plays out. And it's a big part in what you're creating. So think about your tech level. Like, are we doing medieval? Are we doing renaissance? Are we doing ancient? And think about your magic. Where does magic come from? Who has access to it? How do you get new magic if you are a magic user? How many magic users exist? Is is it something that every player can be able to play? Are you going to put limits on how many magic users you have in your group? Or are you going to a whole group of magic users? This all makes a huge difference in your world building. I'd be curious to know how you've used magic to shape your world. Or maybe you haven't. Maybe you haven't thought about this before and now it's making you think about it. Have you created worlds where it's very rare, where it's more common? Have you changed the way that magic users get spells or do you keep it the same? Have you made it easier to to cast? Harder to cast? Why? I'd be curious to know. Let me know in the comments below. Also, subscribe and ring the bell so you get notifications. And I'll see you next time.